if you will, turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. I think I need to say a little bit about this message before I begin preaching it. Um, I, this Bible is a um, uh, interleaf Bible. You've seen them. I, I believe that John Stansel uh, and the Anchor Bible, he put one together and uh, it didn't work for me. So I put my mind together myself. I got a Cambridge Bible and cut both ends out of it and cut the back out of it and took the concordance out and then put a piece of thin paper in between every other page. And in this Bible, I have about a thousand outlines. Now, my outlines, you know, would look pitiful beside your pastor's outlines. It, uh, you know, I... Uh, uh, my, my outlines are pretty pitiful. But um, I have three of these. And uh, I don't go back and just preach things just because, you know, it's my sugar stick. This isn't my sugar stick. And I have uh, begun this sermon here before. But of the thousands of sermons that I have preached, if I had a chance, just one chance, to preach to a crowd of people that I believe were mostly saved, it would be this ser sermon right here. This is, this is the one. And if you would ever say, well, I wonder why God sent Brother Lancaster here. He may have sent me here for you to hear what I'm about to give you tonight. And so... When we pray, you please pray for me. Romans chapter 12, and would you stand to your feet as I read a portion of God's Word. And by the way, the pastor told me that he had already recently uh, preached from this passage of Scripture, knowing the will of God. That's what I'm going to preach on tonight. So basically what you could do is just go to sleep and remember what he said, and, uh, and, uh, but I'll give you... And I, I do have something that I have only begun to share in the last couple of years about this passage of Scripture because I only learned it in the last couple of years. I don't know about you, but I'm still learning. Romans chapter 12 and beginning with verse 1. The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that which is, uh, what, what is good, good, and acceptable, and perfect will of God. Thank you, and you may be seated. Let me see if this tastes as good as Tennessee water. Not quite, but it's good. It's good. Would you pray with me, please? Father, help me. Lord, I need your help. You know that. Help me, oh God. Lord, if I use all of the ability that I have... I'll fail tonight, but you, God, but you, God, help me, help the dear people. Thank you for this wonderful church. Thank you that light goes out from this church all over the world, not only in missionaries, but also in people who have been discipled. And Lord, some may say that they have been sent to their new duty station by their government, which is not true. You sent them there, and you place people where you want them to be. So I thank you, dear God, for this wonderful lighthouse. Thank you for our pastor and his wife, family. 
Dear God, help me now and speak to hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. In 1967, I had a decision to make. I had been a Christian at that time for four years. I sensed that God had something else for me. My decision was stay in or get out. I was preaching everywhere I went. I was preaching up and down the Ryukyu Islands. I started a preaching station, not a church. I was too dumb to know how to do it in those days. But in Iceland, I witnessed to people, won people to the Lord uh, as much as I possibly could everywhere I went. But there was something moving me. There was something that was unsettling me. There was something that inside of me said, I've got something else. And I had a decision to make. Get out, stay in. Now, that decision included some questions. If I get out, what will I do? I quit high school because I had better things to do in those days. And I don't have my high school diploma. If I get out and if I should tell somebody, I believe God's called me to preach. I probably would be recommended to go to college. I'm dead sure that I'll never pass. I don't have the ability. I said then. How am I going to take care of my wife? And this is with no disrespect to you. I know you work hard. I have been there. But if I get out, I'm going to lose my security. What, what, what should I do? We've got a, we've got a child. How am I going to take care of that child? If I do get out and should I go to school, finish my diploma and go to college, then what should I tell them? I'm going to be a preacher. Oh, no. <laughs> no, 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 I, I, I don't have the ability to do that. Um, maybe if I could teach in a school, maybe I could serve the Lord that way. A lot of questions. I, um, I was on the island of Okinawa at that time. There was no Maranatha at that time. There was no independent Baptist church there at that time. I attended a Southern Baptist church while I was on the island of Okinawa in 19... 66 and 65. The old missionary, Brother Bill Medling, was a wonderful, wonderful man. And he told me, he said, Tommy, I believe that you are interested in growing in the Lord. My reply probably was something like, you got it, you got it. I want to grow in the Lord. He said, would you let me teach you the Bible once a week? We'll get together once a week, and I'll spend an hour, and I'll teach you the Bible as much as I can until you leave. I said, oh. So weekly, I met with Brother Bill Medling, and weekly, he taught me the Bible taught me basic doctrines, taught me how to study for myself the Word of God. And then he broadened it into other things. And um, I got close to the time when I was supposed to PCS 
or ETS out of the Marine Corps. And I still had these decisions. On one of our meetings, I told Brother Meddling, I said, I've got some decisions to make. Let me stop right here and say this. Are any of you so wise that you no longer have decisions to make? Are any of you so old that you don't think it's important? Are any of you so young and dumb that you don't think you need to make decisions? No, we've all got decisions to make. And those decisions that you're going to make are going to affect your life. As you sit here tonight, and I believe there are parents and young people and military people right here that have made wonderful decisions. But the decisions that you make right now are going to mean what you will be down the road. The decisions that you are making now. I told Brother Meddling, I said, Brother Meddling, I've got some decisions to make. I said, I'm going to come next week for the study, and I want to spend some time with you after we get through, and I want you to tell me what I need to do. My basic question was this. Brother Medley, how do I find out what the will of God is for my life? That was it. I came back the next week. We had our study, and I got my pad and paper out and ready because I knew he was going to point one, point two, point three, point four, point five. And I said, Brother Medley, answer my question. How do I know the will of God? How do I know what God wants me to do? He said, put that away. You won't need it. You'll never forget it. And he was right. And if you'll listen to me for a little while, in about 30 minutes or so, I'll tell you what he told me. But I want you to look at this passage of Scripture first. I beseech you. Did you know when it comes to salvation, there is no middle ground? Get born again, go to heaven, enjoy the blessings of God here in your own life. Born again, born again. You must be born again. Not born again, hell. Influence on others for bad, for eternity without God. Decision, saved, heaven. Decision, not saved, hell, judgment. There is no middle ground. Many of you probably come from a Catholic background. The Catholics try to make money through teaching and burning candles concerning purgatory and getting people out of purgatory. There is no purgatory. All you got to do is just read the Bible. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. After death cometh the judgment, God's Word says. There is no, we're going to get saved here on this earth or we're not going to get saved. And... Um, so there is no middle ground. But did you know that when it comes to the matter of service, you really can be a Christian and not be committed to the Lord? You can. In my pointed Marine Corps terminology, you can be a Christian, but spiritually speaking, not worth the gunpowder it would take to shoot you as a Christian. Now, you say, you mean that I can be a Christian, go to heaven, and not really live for the Lord? Yes. As a matter of fact, you may go quicker than other people if you don't put him first in your life. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Aren't you glad he's a merciful God? full of mercy, full of grace. He's a merciful, gracious God. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present, present. 
Give it, give your life to him. Surrender to him. Surrender your life to him. Now, I've met people and they've said this. Preacher, I've surrendered my life to the Lord two or three times and it didn't work. The reason it didn't work is because you didn't do it. If you do it, it'll work. If there's nothing mixed up with what you say you're doing, if that's the most important thing in your life, oh God, I'm surrendering my life to you. Take it and use my life. Uh, send me where you want to send me. Do with me what you want to do with me. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies and everything that's in it. Mind, will, desire, uh, present it to God. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. And how is it? Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I've lived on both sides. And, and uh, when I mean on both sides, I mean I lived way on the other side in my prior life. And I've lived this life. Do you know what I've got to announce to you tonight? His way is the best way. His way is the good way. That you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, I'd like to spend some time about that word reasonable. Let me just say that he made you. He knows you. I have a, a friend that I used to hunt with in... Uh, 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 down in uh, southern Mississippi, and it's it's legal, and it's you know to hunt with dogs, and so we hunted with dogs, and uh, the dogs would drive the deer, and we'd stand at different places in the woods there. Hopefully, the deer would come by us, and we'd be able to to uh, uh, harvest a deer. And one day we got put in our places and. And the man who was heading up the hunt, he said, uh, hey, we, we've, uh, we, we've uh, uh, loosed all the dogs, uh, but uh, no, we haven't loosed all the dogs, and we've still got some places to put the dogs. And uh, all the trucks and jeeps are gone. One guy said, I, I'll, I'll go get my vehicle. And so we saw him walk away over the hill, and in a few moments, we heard bump, thud, screech, bump, thud, screech, screech. And, uh, and here he comes down the hill, through the bushes, through the creek to pick up the dogs and put them in the vehicle. It was a brand new Lincoln town car. Did you know some Lincoln Town cars are not made for that? God made you, and he's made you for a purpose. God's made me, and he has not made you or me to live for self. He's made you and me to live for him, surrender to him. I beseech you, therefore, now we need to think about the, what the therefore is there for. And I believe that the therefore is up in chapter 11 and verse 36. Chapter 11, verse 36 says, For of him, Jesus, and through him, Jesus, and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. This whole universe, this whole humanity, it revolves around one person, Jesus Christ. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about him. It's about glorifying him through obedience, through doing what he tells us to do. Jesus himself said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Do what I've told you to do. And so, look, if you will, in verse 2, and be not conformed to this world, don't let the world mold you into its image. And I'm becoming more and more aware as I talk to more young people 
that the music of this world has a tremendous impact on you and the devil knows that, please guard your ears and guard what comes into your mind. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. The word is metamorphosis. Be transformed. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What's your favorite computer? How many of you, your favorite is a Toshiba? Got any Toshiba people here? All of you are too rich for Toshiba. There's another poor man like myself. God bless you. Uh, how many of you, it's Dell? Any, any Dell folks here? How many of you are Apple? Yeah, that's what I figured. <laughs> yeah. But did you know something about your Apple computer? If you don't put the right information in it, it's not worth junk. Am I right? I mean, you just begin putting information in and putting it in and then try to get an answer. Not right answer, not going to come out. You and I make decisions that will affect our lives. And if we don't have the right information, in here. That's why I beg you. I beg you. I plead with you. Be a man of the Word of God. Study it. Love it. Obey it. Obey God's Word. Let it be a part of your life, a vital part of your life. That you may be, your minds may be renewed and prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Prove it. When I was a kid, one of my buddies would say, I tell you what, you, you see that tree over there? I can pick up this big rock and I can throw it and hit that tree over there. You know what I'd tell him? Prove it. Prove it. God says that he'll prove what he says. He'll prove it. When you and I do the will of God, God will prove what he has promised in this book. Turn back, if you will, to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapters 1 through 5, the subject is justification. How do you get saved? When you get to chapter 6 and forward, the subject is sanctification. How do you live? How do you live? Both of them are by grace. Both of them are by grace. But we have some wonderful insights that we may appropriate that grace here in Romans chapter 6. I've asked you to do this before on my previous time here, but let me ask you to do it again for those of you that were not here. There are four words that I'd like for you to underline. They are very important. Look, if you will, at verse 3 of chapter 6. No. Look down at verse 6. Uh, uh, ver verse 3 is no. Look at verse 6, knowing. Look at verse 9, no. Look at verse 16, no. God wants us to know. This is the no book. This is the no book. I had a teenager in my church, and, and she said, uh, Brother Lancaster, would you pray for me and my boyfriend? And I said, I've been praying for you diligently. She said, oh, that's wonderful. I'm glad you have. And I said, honey, you may not appreciate the way I've been praying for you. She said, what do you mean? I said, I'm praying that you will break up with him or he'll break up with you as quick as possible. And she said, preacher, that's not like you. I said, honey, that's just like me. I said, where does he go to church? She said, he's a good young man. I said, where does he go to church? She said, he's a good young man. I said, tell me where he goes to church. She said, you know he's a Mormon. I said, yeah, I know he's a Mormon. 
And God's word says, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. This is the no book. The man that beat my mother up the night my mother committed suicide. I almost killed him. I beat him until I couldn't beat him any longer. Some people pulled me off of him. I did other things to him as well. But when he was found guilty of murder a few years later, and I was subpoenaed from Camp Lejeune to go to his trial and be a state's witness against Louis Montesi in his trial, when they found him guilty of first degree murder, I stepped forward and started walking down towards the defendant's bench. And two of his bodyguards, because he had hired bodyguards because I had threatened to kill him. And I had fired shots in his house. I set his house on fire. I beat him twice until I couldn't beat him any longer. And when I walked towards that defendant's desk, Two of his bodyguards caught me. And the district attorney, Mr. Glanker, he came up to me and those two men that were holding me by the arms. And he said, you let Tommy Lancaster alone. I know him. He's not going to hurt him. And after all, we have, we have a policeman in the courtroom to take care of that. And I walked forward and I put my hand on the shoulder of a man that I absolutely despised. The man that had taken his old brutish hands and beaten my mother up. I put my hand on his shoulder and he turned around and looked at me and fear came across his face. But I said, Louis, you'll never understand this until what happened to me happens to you. But I forgive you. Now, I did that not because I was a good Christian. I knew that because I was never going to have any peace in my own heart until I forgave him. But I forgave him. You know why I did that? One of the reasons? Because the Bible says to do that. Forgive people. Let, let me just take a shotgun and pull the trigger and shoot out here and see if it hits anybody. Anybody you're holding a grudge against? Anybody on the face of God's green earth you haven't forgiven? Anybody that makes your blood boil a little bit when you think about them or you're in their presence? This is a no book. This is a no book. Look, if you will, at the second word. What's the first word, class? What's the first one? No. No, here's, here, here's the second word, verse 11. Likewise, reckon, reckon, reckon. Uh, that's an auditor's word. That's, uh, that's uh, uh, apply what you know. Apply what you know. Is there anything that you know? Maybe you've read it in your Bible. Maybe your daddy or your mama taught it to you. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe the preacher preached on it or your Sunday school teacher taught it. Is there anything that you know that you haven't reacted properly to? Apply what you know. Apply what you know. What's the first word, class? No. What's the second word, class? Reckon, which means to apply what you know. Here's the third word. Look at verse 13. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself to God. When the Bible says yield your members, it's not talking about us saying, God, don't you take these members of this church and deal with them. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about our eyes, our ears, our mouth, our feet, our hands. Yield them to God. God, uh, I, I, I want to walk where you want me to walk today. God, uh, don't, don't let me think bad thoughts towards people or, or thoughts of, oh, don't, don't let me think the wrong things, dear God. Oh, God, control my hands today. And, and dear Lord, control my mind uh, today. Yield it to God. You. That's why I'm convinced that our prayer life ought to be an ongoing reality through the day. God, I, I'm going into this store, and they're probably going to have some of those dirty magazines there at the cash register. And God, I don't know any other place to get gas. Uh, but God, help me that I don't listen to that. I, I don't look at that. 
God, I'm going to turn on television, but Lord, when they, when they begin cussing, uh, help me to turn it off, no matter how interesting it might be. Help me to turn it off. Oh, God, don't let me look at that lady the wrong way. Don't let me do that. Oh, God, don't, don't let me be bitter about things. Daily, daily. You, uh, that's a wonderful uh, song that says, he walks with me and he talks with me. Oh, what a joy to walk and talk with him. And then, what's the first word, class? What's the second word, class? Which means to apply what you know. What's the third word, class? Yield. Now, um, I want you to, I want you to uh, just take a, uh, a side trip. Turn over to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3. Now, when I say that, many of you probably know exactly where I'm going, and I would recommend that you learn it. Put it in your heart. Uh, be able to bring it up regularly. Proverbs 3, uh, verse 5. Trust in the Lord. Woo! <laughs> you say, I tell you what, uh, I, I, I want to hold on to, to my retirement or, or uh, whatever. Oh, no, trust in the Lord. Trust in Him. Uh, uh, Lord, I, I, I just don't ever think that I could surrender my life uh, to do anything. Uh, uh, trust in the Lord. Trust Him. Trust in the Lord. Don't do it half-heartedly. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And look further. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. We say, Brother Lancaster, in my years of life and in my ability to think and reason, this is what I think. It doesn't mean beans what you think or what I think. What does make a difference is what this book says. And we, you and I, we must obey the book and not our thinking, not our thinking. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Now I've probably, this is, this is such a thrill to me, this portion of the scripture. In all of thy ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Ways, paths. How many of you have been to Germany? Been to Germany, 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 Germany. Okay, Audubon. Last time I saw Brother Grady on the Audubon, uh, he was probably doing 160 or 170. I don't know whether he was ever like that. But if you get on the German Audubon and you're going 100 miles an hour, you better get in the far right lane because they're going to run you over. Uh, I mean, it's nothing to see them come by. You know, you'll see them in the rear view mirror. Well, I don't have any worry. They're back there probably three miles, zoom, and they're, and, they're, and they're gone by you. Did you know that the Autobahn was designed by Adolf Hitler? It was designed by Adolf Hitler to get troops to places faster and also to use for planes to take off and land. General Dwight D. Eisenhower brought back our interstate system after having seen the Autobahn in Germany, Audubon, interstate, big. Any of you familiar with, uh, say, Chattanooga to Atlanta? If I want to get from Chattanooga to Atlanta, what interstate do I use? How about 75? from Chattanooga to Atlanta. A lot of good things down there. Good food. Some good preachers. Great churches. But there's one thing in Atlanta that warms my heart every time I think about it. What interstate did I say it was? 75. Chattanooga, Atlanta. Big highway. Get on it and you're gone. 70 miles an hour. Just set your cruise control on 69 or 70 and settle back and, and hum hymns all the way there. 
But there's something there that just thrills me. <laughs> Bass Pro Shop. <laughs> it's wonderful. It's, now, what highway is that? But did you know if you were a newcomer to Chattanooga and if you lived where I live, you may not know how to get to 75. I may be able to tell you there is a big bass pro shop down in Atlanta and if you'll get on 75 and you get near Atlanta, there'll be a big sign that'll say turn off and exit so and so to bass pro shop but you're in trouble if you don't know how to get to 75. I didn't know how to be married. All of my family Homes were broken. Father was a drunkard. Mother was an alcoholic. My grandfather was a bootlegger and a gambler. And one day, somebody stuck a shotgun through the open window in his car and killed him right there in the car. That's my people. I didn't know anything. Didn't know how to be married certainly didn't know how to raise a child, didn't know how to live, didn't know how to treat other people. But I got saved, and long about that time, I said, Lord, I don't know how to love my wife. I love her with all of the human love that I can, but I don't know how to love her the way a wife needs to be loved. I'm going to commit that to you. One day, I came home and she said, Tommy, we're going to have a baby. And I said, wow. And then I thought, I don't know how to raise a kid. He might turn out just like I was when I was younger. I don't know how to make decisions. How? Do I know the will of God? What's first word class? What's the second word class? What's the third word class? And then look at Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk. The Christian life is a walk. On May the 15th, 1963, John Hobson told me, he said, you ought to get saved, Tommy. I could have turned around and looked back and I could have seen misery, failure, disappointment, hurting others, not doing anything to make an impact for good on the lives of anybody. I got saved. My preacher showed me the scripture and I did it. He came to me sometime, when I say sometime, he came to me within just two or three days. Tommy, uh, you need to get baptized now. You get baptized next Sunday. You do that. Yes, sir. Uh, Tommy, I, I see you uh, throwing your cigarette butts out on the uh, churchyard after you get through, you know, when you, when you come in, you need to quit smoking. You, you need to quit doing that. That's not a good testimony. I never drank anymore. The Holy Spirit already spoke to me about that. He said, Tommy, I know you've got bitterness in your heart. You've told me about it. Get rid of it. Turn it over to the Lord. Tommy, you've already talked to me about your fear of being married and that you don't have what it takes. 
You already told me. I'm going to show you the scripture. Still making decisions. I used to think they'll all be over with one day. I'll get to be able to put my life on cruise control. I'm still making decisions. I told Brother Medling, I said, Brother Medling, I want you next week to tell me how I can know the will of God. We got through with our Bible lesson. I had my pen and paper ready to go. Point one, point two, point three. He said, put it away. You'll, you'll never forget what I'm going to tell you. I said, okay. He said, now what's your question? How do I know the will of God? How do I know what God wants me to do? He said, Tommy, you will know what God wants you to do by doing what you know God wants you to do. He looked at me like most of you are looking at me right now. He said, you want me to explain that to you? I said, yes, sir. He said, God's not obligated to give you any more information until you use the information you've already got. Are you using the information you've got? When he specifically spoke to your heart about not doing that, are you still doing that? When he specifically spoke to your heart about you ought to start this, have you started it yet? Are you doing what God wants you to do? Remember Proverbs chapter uh, 3 and verse 6, verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding, and in all of thy ways... Oh, I, I, I wish I could throw something right now. Man, this excites me more than I know. Trust in Him. Commit your way to Him, autobahns, interstates. Commit those to Him, and here's what He'll do. He'll direct your paths. God says, give me, give me your big stuff. Commit your big stuff to me and mean it. That's only, you know, if you, don't, if you don't mean it, you didn't commit it. But commit your big stuff to me. Commit it to me. Commit it to me. And I'll direct you in the little steps that will get you there to the big stuff. How to stay married, happy. How to be a blessing to your daddy and your mama. How to honor your father and your mother how to, how to adore your wife. It thrilled me. I tell you, you want to take some good examples? I sat behind this blessed couple this morning and I saw him reach over and get the hand of his sweetheart. How long y'all been married now? 42 years and still in love. Still sweethearts. Oh, I tell you what, you commit things like that to God and God will show you the little steps to get to those big things. Anything you need to straighten out tonight? Anything God's spoken to you about and you say, well, God, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do this, but I'm not going to do this. I'm going to lead, lead me on to the next one. He's not going to lead you on to any next one until you deal with the one that you've already, he's already spoken to you about. Now, I got one more thing and I'll quit. Oh, this is so, so wonderful, I can't hardly stand it. But um, look, if you will, at Romans chapter 12 and verse 3. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable. Say the next word with me. Perfect. Perfect. Did you know if you read the Bible long enough, intently enough, maybe use a concordance to go to other places where the same verse is, you'll learn some things that are just not glaring. And you know the Lord did it that way. The Lord doesn't put everything just right out there. He puts some things where we've got to look and study and uh, find out what, exactly what he's talking about. Now, none of you are ever going to be perfect on this earth. Am I correct? None of you are ever going to make perfect decisions. Am I correct? But we will 
be able to have what in many places the Bible calls a perfect life. And in a minute, I'll tell you what that word perfect means in its context. But let me ask you this. My dear brother, how long have you been married to this lovely lady? Thirteen years. Is she the one? Are you sure? Yes, sir. Your first name? My name's Anna. Mamie? Anna. Anna. Anna, did you get the right guy? Yes. Did you? Yes. You sure? <laughs> if the preacher would let you out of it, would you get out of it? Now, I want you to do this. Is that important to you to be married to the right man? Is it important to you to be married to the woman that you said, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, forsaking all others, I give myself only unto you? Is that important to you? Sir. Show me where you found it in the scripture that you ought to be married to her. Show me where it, where it says... Show me in the Bible where it tells you that you should have gone to West Coast Baptist College. Got it? But it's important. It's big stuff. Did you know something? God wants to guide you in the biggest decisions that you have in this life. If you listen to him and if you'll do what he's already told you to do, if you do what he's already told you to do, he'll give you more information. And you can look back and you can say, like I can, I can look back now as a 77-year-old man that got saved when he was 23 years old, just out of jail, to a beautiful, beautiful girl that didn't know what she was getting herself into. And I can say, oh, yeah, there have been bumps and there have been challenges, but oh, this is a wonderful life, a wonderful life. And God sure has been good to me and good to my family.